Hey everyone, I am back. I am so excited to introduce to all of you today a brand new stock that is on my personal watch list. This is a stock based out of Germany with a iconic brand, if you will, and I'm considering adding it to my personal dividend stock portfolio. Here in the United States, I don't hear a lot of chatter about this stock in particular in the dividend community, in the investing community, but I'm excited about it because it pays a huge 9% dividend and the price earnings ratio right now is between two and three. But on any given normal year, a normalized earnings year, maybe the PE ratio would be in the fours, fives, or sixes. I'm talking about a company that facilitates global trade, and we know that's probably a somewhat risky industry to be in now because there's a lot of change happening right now with nationalization. We know there's a lot of change happening right now with some initiatives out of China, like the One Belt, One Road initiative that could change global trade as we know it. And we know there's a lot of risk right now with rising fuel prices. Despite all of these factors, Hapag Lloyd, that is the stock I'm going to cover today. It trades in the U.S. as an American depository receipt. It's an unsponsored American depository receipt through BNY Mellon. I look forward to discussing this stock in great detail today because one of my best performing stocks of all time, surprisingly, has been the railroad, North folks Southern. And when I think about the transportation industry, when I think about getting the goods to um, consumers at the end that they need, I think about efficient means of transportation. And when I think about efficiency, I think about railroads and I think about global shipping companies like Hapag Lloyd. So I'm really excited to cover this company in the video today. Get ready, everyone, for a really exciting dividend stock investing analysis. Welcome to PPC Ian. This is Dividend Stock Investing for Everyone. All right, everyone. Before we get started today, if you're excited to learn about a new stock, please go ahead and smash that like button. It means the world to me. And if you're here from Germany, please put in the comments below. I love my global subscribers. That's one of my favorite things about this community. And as a dividend investor, I'm always looking internationally, globally for opportunities to add companies to my dividend stock portfolio that might not be based out of the, out of the United States. And so, also, don't forget to subscribe. And also, please show me some extra love on the video today if you can in the comments, in the likes, in the subscriptions. Because my last video, boy, I've covered sin stocks here. I've covered uh, fast food companies. I've covered... Um, Companies that make soda, I've covered big pharma, big oil, you name it, I've covered it. And all of these companies have been embraced by the dividend community. But I went out on a limb and I covered a vacation ownership company in the last video. And boy, that was where kind of the line was drawn in the sand. Certain people were like, Ian, you've gone too far with that company, too controversial for me. And so anyways, that surprised me quite a bit, but it's all good. Anyway, show me some extra love on this video, everyone. It really would help me out. And so I want to get started with my analysis today. Before I do, check out the pinned comment below. I have a link in there to my Patreon. I have so much bonus content over on Patreon, including my complete dividend stock portfolio that's on Corner Patreon with a percentage allocation to each position. Let's get going. As you can see on the screen in front of you right now, I want to start with a stock chart. As you can see, this is Hapag Lloyd ADR. And the ADR, the American Depository Receipt, is HPGLY. Very thinly traded. I'll get to that in a minute. But what you can see here is it's up and to the right. And it's gone from that $20 range back in 2018 all the way up now to $145. And so 
I like to see this because I invest for dividends, but I invest for dividend growth. I invest for the long term. And I like companies that are growing, companies that have great stock performance because it's indicative that my dividends can possibly go up over time. If the company is performing well and the stock is going up as a result of the company performing well, they sure will have more room to increase the dividend. And as you can see on the screen in front of you right now, the second slide I want to show today is yet another stock chart. And this one compares Hapag Lloyd versus some of their competitors. And so um, I have their uh, competitors, um, I hope I'm saying these names right, but AP Moeller uh, Maersk and also Matson Inc. And you can see, however, that Hapag Lloyd is uh, crushing them in terms of last five years performance. And that's really why I zoned in on Hapag Lloyd because they have a growth through acquisition strategy. They're focused on Africa, which is a huge growth continent right now. And it seems that they're really getting into uh, technological improvements on their software, on their systems, on their technology. And I believe that over the long run, this constant focus on innovation is going to fuel continued growth at this company. And because they're a top 10 global shipping company, but they're not number one, there's still a lot of room for this company to grow over time. And so this is really why I zoned in on this company, because it offers a dividend. It offers a lot of growth but they're also outperforming the uh, competitors on the growth side. And so I want to keep going. As you can see on the screen in front of you now, the next slide, I have so much ground to cover today. I have just a quick uh, dividend analysis. And so this is a company that would probably not appeal to your classical dividend stock investor. As many of you know, I have a portfolio that is very core focused. Most of my money are in my core stocks. If I add to this stock, it would be an ancillary position. I know I'm going to get a lot of feedback saying, Ian, didn't you say in 2022 you we're only going to focus on core stocks. Well, here we are, and I'm looking at another ancillary position. I can't help myself. It just is what it is. But basically, I don't see this stock becoming core for me. It would probably be a stock if I added, I'd add it about maybe 0.8% of the portfolio, leave it there, uh, reinvest dividends, and just check on it again in maybe 20 years. But the fact of the matter is this company has... Um, not been paying a substantial dividend until just recently. And the reason it paid a substantial dividend in 2022 is because the uh, stock has just performed very well. The company fundamentally has performed incredibly well. I'm going to get to that in a minute. This uh, last year or the first half of uh, this year, they just really crushed numbers like I've never really seen. And hence the PE is uh, below three right now if you forecast those earnings forward. But basically you can see here, the dividend has been low. They pay it once per year. It's at the discretion of the leaders, of the board, of the stakeholders at the company. And um, this is a company I'll get to later that is mostly owned and concentrated by just a few uh, countries and families and um, uh, big stakeholders, whereas uh, the percentage of the float that's available for everyday people like you and me is very small. But the uh, dividend, it's not paid quarterly. It's paid annually, and it's largely at the discretion, again, of the um, board. And it's largely a function of how well they do that year. And so this is the kind of thing that's not going to offer predictable cash flow. This is the kind of thing that's not going to allow someone, oh, I can budget my living expenses and easily pay my living expenses off of this. But this is the kind of company that foreseeably looking into the future is going to play a huge role, continue to play a huge role as it has since the 1800s um, in terms of global trade. And they're going to reward shareholders over time with dividends. And it just so happens that the forward yield now, if they can keep up what they're doing is at 9.44%. But I do want to say to all of you, I don't see that continuing. And so this is a boom bust business. This is a business that has a lot of variability. Thankfully, their balance sheet is strong so they can shoulder just about anything that comes their way. But I just think the dividend, it's going to bounce around a lot over the years in the future. We can't always count on a dividend yield this high, but over very long periods of time, I could see it going up into the right. By the way, why did I get excited about this company? I'll tell you, there's two reasons, and this is how dividend investing goes for me. Put in the comments below how you discover new companies but how I discovered this new company is uh, twofold. One, I was searching for vacations just on TripAdvisor as I do sometimes. I'm bringing back the topic of vacations. I know here in this community, I guess vacations are very controversial. <laughs> I do apologize if I'm offending more people talking about vacations again, but I was on TripAdvisor and uh, basically when I was looking on TripAdvisor, I was just looking for some fun places to visit. 
And I happened to be looking at Savannah, Georgia, and I was looking at some of the hotels there. I was looking at the Westin Hotel, and it's right near the harbor there, and it had some photos on TripAdvisor. It was so interesting from folks who have stayed at that hotel, and they showed pictures of the big container ships coming in, and one of them said Hapag Lloyd, and I'm like, wait a minute, Ian. I've seen this so many times before. I got to look into this company, and it's almost subliminal because the other day I was at Dutch Bros, and I'm going to share. Uh, this is local here in the greater Boise, Idaho area where I live now is you can see on the screen in front of you right now I was at Dutch Bros and right next to Dutch Bros where they're developing some new land there was a big Hapag Lloyd container that I just had to get a picture next to and I felt that this was such an inter interesting coincidence that I saw it on TripAdvisor then I see it next to Dutch Bros I'm like I just got to look into this thing and when I started looking into it I really liked what I saw in terms of the numbers and I like what I know about this type of industry from my experience with Norfolk Southern and so here we are today talking about Hapag Lloyd. So I want to share on the screen with you next some thoughts. Check it out. I'm going to start today with the thoughts, then I'm going to get into the numbers. And so I'm doing a little backwards today, but I think it's important to seed these thoughts with the community so you can think about them as we go through the video and go through the numbers today. And so deep thoughts, high level thoughts, they're in 120 countries with 20,000 customers. The company Hapag Lloyd has been public since 2015, but they, they um, basically have roots back to the 1800s, which I like. I invest in kind of iconic brands uh, within their respective industries. Hapag was formed in around 1847. Lloyd was formed around 1857, and they merged in 1970 to create Hapag Lloyd. But publicly traded uh, speaking, my understanding, it's just since 2015. And so HPGLY is the American depository receipt. It's thinly traded, doesn't bother me as a buy and hold forever investor, but for someone who needs a lot of liquidity, um, might not make sense. I mean, I'm talking very thinly traded, like a few hundred shares a day or something. So very, very thinly traded. And I'd have to be careful setting limit orders to buy this so I don't get taken advantage of potentially putting a market order on something that's so thinly traded. Um, in recent years, as I showed in the stock chart, it's outpacing its competitors, shows me they're on a growth trajectory. This is an industry I have ignored in the past because it faced a lot of boom-bust cycles. The best companies in this industry manage their balance sheets well, and Hapag Lloyd has done that. I'm going to get to that later. They're facing a boom right now, and I would be buying it if I bought it now into a boom. It's probably not the right time to buy it, probably better to buy it during the bust. Um, that being said, I can't control time that well. And honestly, I am better at just dollar cost averaging into companies than trying to time the market. Although when the market is tanking and I see opportunity, then I go extra heavy. Um, they're doing really well now because of high freight rates. We don't know if these high freight costs will last forever. Customers may not shoulder this kind of cost forever. They have low debt as compared to robust earnings. I talked about that. We'll get to it later. Long term, I see a lot of benefit in this industry from increased technology and AI. The dividend is at the discretion of the board, paid 1x a year, it can fluctuate. This probably doesn't make sense for most dividend investors due to unpredictability. For me, it could as an ancillary position because I don't need predictability. If I'm buying this, I'm buying it really for 20 years out. Money I put in this today isn't doing anything for me until 20 plus years out. Foreign taxes are going to be withheld being a German company, but um, worth noting any foreign taxes that are withheld, to my understanding, please contact your licensed tax professional. I'm not offering tax advice. It can be claimed as a credit potentially on certain uh, U.S. tax returns. So look into that with your licensed tax professional. But I know a lot of dividend investors don't like messing around with foreign tax withholding and these credits, so on and so forth. Um, the current dividend yield is uh, a nice 9% range, but I don't know if it's sustainable. By the way, I've seen a lot of figures on the internet, such as 12% plus. The figures are hard to get to on this. There's so little information about it in, here in the United States, and that's why I thought I'd cover it here on YouTube. I think this is probably one of the first videos or even pieces of content at all on this company in the United States. I love to invest in networks, global networks, networks at scale. That's why I talked about that uh, vacation ownership company in my last video, because that is a network of sorts. Networks drive a lot of value. That's why I like Norfolk Southern. It is a network. Um, that's why I like companies like Dutch Bros that have really good apps, because those apps create loyalty, and there's a network of sorts there. Hapag Lloyd is a global uh, maritime uh, network of commerce uh, in the ocean on container ships. And they've been growing through acquisition and they've been doing it prudently. They've been taking out startups. They've been doing that because honestly, there's so much profit in this industry. 
that if they don't acquire, competitors can kind of pop out of nowhere. I've seen this in the elevator industry as well. If there's ever a startup in the elevator industry that's of any success, one of the big guys like Otis, which I own, will gobble it up. And so I want to keep going. I have some figures I want to go through now. So as you can see on the screen in front of you right now, check it out. What you see here is the first half report for 2022. And so at the top of this, I just paste the numbers I got from the company's press release. I did this in US dollars because my channel here is based out of the United States. I know a lot of folks here, it's easier for them to look at this in dollars versus euros, but some of the figures I'll share in the video today are in euros as well. I don't need to spend a lot of time here other than the portion below that chart at the top, which shows the 2022 analysis, and then on the right-hand side of the screen, the 2021 analysis. I take the 1H revenue for 2022, I multiply it um, by two to annualize it, roughly. So we're getting like 37 billion uh, revenue and you can see the profit was uh, 9 billion. But if I double it, I assume the second half will be as good as the first half. That's a, like 18 billion. And so you see a profit margin here. If I just take the annualized group profit and I divide by the annualized group revenue of 51%. So profits are out of the world this year. Although last year they're coming in at like 77% if I do the same analysis. And, um, I have a market capitalization right now based on the ADR of $51 billion. And so if I basically take the group earnings and I compare that to the market capitalization, I'm getting a PE ratio here of about 2.7, last year about four. But keep in mind, this can jump around quite a bit. And so it's not always gonna be this low. I'm sure certain years it could be like 10, 20, you know, it can fluctuate quite a, quite a bit. Um, on the bottom of the screen, I just put some information that I got from another calculation, but the current price per share of the ADR is 145. The dividend is 13.73, so you get a 9.4% yield. Payout ratio, by the way, is calculated around 68%. And last year it was similar. I didn't include it on this screenshot, but it was in a, not a similar yield, but a similar um, payout ratio range. And so um, that's what I'm talking about with this company, what really piqued my interest. And I think we're in a boom cycle now. And so look, is it the best time to buy it in a boom cycle? Put in the um, comments below. They're um, charging just huge freight rates right now to their end customers customers and the end customers are paying it for now. I don't know if that will maintain forever, but right now things are going really well at this company and they're bringing in so much cash that they can basically pay off all the debt the company has in basically like one year's time. And so they're doing really well with the, um, profitability of the business right now. And with that being said, as you can see on the screen in front of you right now, what I want to share is just um, the press release, the Hapag Lloyd with a very good result in the first half of 2022. And, um, you can see it's significantly higher than in the year ago period. Transport volume, though, it's pretty much similar to the year ago period. So all of the growth is from pricing, from that freight pricing. They're upgrading their outlook. There are uncertainties, obviously, due to global strife, global war in Ukraine, and uh, the pandemic. And so there are certain things that um, could uh, possibly cause a lot of uncertainty with a business like this, just as with any business. But when I think about a business like this, can any of us really get by day to day without global trade? I think global trade will always be important and whether there are global problems or not, it's companies like Hapag Lloyd and Norfolk Southern for that matter that will run their operations and will get the goods to the end customers that need those goods no matter what is going on out there. And so they play a very key role in the backbone of global society in my humble opinion. I want to keep going. I've got a lot to cover today. If you enjoyed so far, please smash the like button and put your thoughts below. Is this a winner or a loser? Do you like it? Do you not like it? It fills a kind of little void in my portfolio um, in that uh, global transportation uh, arena. I've got Norfolk Southern, but I don't have a lot more going on than that in that particular niche. And so I always like uh, filling a void when I can find a good company that does it. And it also fills the void of owning a little bit more uh, global exposure in terms of companies that are based outside of the U.S., which is nice as well. Um, check it out on the screen right now. The next thing I want to share are um, some key stats from the annual report. So after looking just at the first half of uh, 2022, I said, hey, let's look at 2021. This one is in euros, but this isn't all the numbers, but these are the numbers that really spoke to me. And the first thing that spoke to me is just 2021 versus 2020, uh, the freight rate was up almost 80% from the prior year. They are charging a higher freight rate, aka inflation, to their end customer, and the end customer is paying it. Earnings per share, looking at 2021 versus 2020, were up 879.7%. 
percent. And so you can see this is a boom bust company. During 2020, they didn't make a lot. Um, obviously, could 2020 happen again? Yes. That's why the, the dividend is not predictable with this company. This is why the share price could go down quite a bit. This is why they have to, quite frankly, have a robust balance sheet. And that's why I like investing in a company. If I were to buy this company that has been around since the 1800s, because they structure the company in a way to weather almost any storm. But I'm not going to kid myself. This has more boom bust than just about anything in my portfolio, probably energy industry included. Dividend was 35 euros in 2021, 350 euros, 3.50 euros in 2020. So 2021, 35, 2023, 50. That just goes to show how the dividend can bounce around so much year to year. You can't always count on the dividend being so high every year, but you, it does seem we can probably count as dividend investors on that payout ratio being somewhere in the 60% range. But 60% of their earnings can fluctuate quite a bit each year because the earnings are volatile. Now, when I was looking at their balance sheet, they had something called borrowed capital. They had something called financial debt and lease liabilities. I look at all of that as debt. It looks to me like they have about 15 billion in euros in debt or almost 16 billion that is in debt in terms of euros. But based on the kind of cash flow that's coming in as we've seen, um, that doesn't seem to be a problem for them to handle that kind of debt. Now, some key points I just noticed in the annual report. Some of these are my notes. Some of these are things I jotted down when I was reading it. Um, I saw that they're really talking about their network and there's value in networks. I like investing in networks. Networks create a lot of wealth. Um, I like that they were really investing in something that they call their quick quotes spot. This is for web-based bookings so that their end customers can book containers based on the web. And they can book all kinds of containers, including refrigerated containers. The white ones, I guess, are refrigerated. That's pretty cool. They have 14,100 employees. They are focused on their supply chain bottlenecks. Customers aren't getting the level of service they are accustomed to, according to Hapag Lloyd, but they're still paying crazy rates for um, shipping. That's just the world we're in right now. One thing I thought was really interesting is they're trying to be carbon neutral by 2045. I don't know how they're going to do this. They may have to offset some of this with carbon credits. Um, boy, it'll be really interesting to see how they do that. That could be a potential risk factor with this company because it may cost a lot of money to be carbon neutral by 2045. Um, they're expanding their market position in Africa. They did this with the acquisition of Nile Dutch. I love seeing this because that is the probably number one growth um, continent right now in our world. Uh, 2021, container ships were backed up. There was waiting time sometimes in the weeks. This goes to the customer um, experience. That's difficult. And um, they have high profitability, but it can allow for startup competitors. They need to keep growing and acquiring. And they've uh, been investing in their container monitoring services so that their end customers can monitor what is happening with the containers. So that's where I'm at just when I look at the balance sheet. I look at the P.E. ratio. I look at the dividend. I look at where the company is at and the heritage of the company. I put all those pieces together. I see a lot of promise with this company. But what I want to do next is I want to just look through a few slides from their annual report that gives some more flavor flavor to all of you at home what this company is about. So as you can see on the screen in front of you right now, the next slide is just what are they focused on these um, next few years? Well, they're focused on profitability. And so I thought that's really important. Um, and I think it's important because they say we need to be vigilant when the market environment normalizes. They know this isn't sustainable. They know this, this kind of crazy um, profits as evidenced by a PE ratio less than three is not going to continue forever. So they're going to be focused on profitability. That's important. I love a company that doesn't just think the good times are going to continue forever. They're focused on being a global player and um, they are focused on the growth industries. I thought that was really important. I think they're really speaking about Africa and other growth industries here, growth continents. They want to be number one for quality. In fact, this is something I saw over and over in their annual report that quality is number one and they're going to do that through technology. They're going to do that through service. I thought that was really important to see um, because quality ultimately is a differentiator and that will differentiate them and continue to allow them to grow quicker than their competitors are. I like, um, I guess, 
All of those, I would say sustainability, I don't know if I like this as much because I think a lot of sustainability this, these days, they're just putting on these things because they have to because the powers that be are requiring this. Honestly, going carbon neutral by 2045, that sounds nice, but boy, at what cost? And so it'll be just interesting to see what happens over time with sustainability. I, I think it's good to try to be as sustainable as possible, but I think they set a pretty robust goal there. And so I think that could be a potential risk factor if it costs them a ton of money to achieve that goal um, from a shareholder standpoint. I want to keep going. There's some more slides that I uh, took some screenshots of. I want to share with all of you. If you're enjoying the video, don't forget to smash the like button. It means the world to me. Let's keep going. As you can see on the screen in front of you right now, I want to share a chart. And what this shows is, is the development of their fleet. And so um, it shows their capacity and it shows the... Um, Basically, container capacity in TTEU on the left, and it shows the ship capacity in TTEU on the right. Long story short, they continue to grow their fleet, and they continue to grow their, their uh, container capacity so that this company can handle more global commerce, more trade than ever before. But what's really interesting is the company's growth right now is largely dependent on people buying stuff all over the world. And I think that will always be the case. I think in more developed economies like Europe and the United States, will consumption slow down at some point as people start realizing, hey, I have too many things. Um, maybe we need to downsize or maybe we need to streamline our life. Maybe we need to simplify. Maybe it's just not good we're consuming so many things because some of them end up in landfill and it's not good for the environment. If that kind of changes, that's a risk factor and all this capacity they're building up could go unused. Then again, there are emerging markets, developing markets like Africa, where I think they will have an evergreen kind of, well, I guess that's a pun because one of their, their competitors is called evergreen, but they will have a evergreen, if you will, need for shipments for a long time as they build up um, the economies around Africa and build up infrastructure, I think uh, supplies will be needed uh, for a very long time. And so I think there's always going to be growth markets like that, but can Hapag Lloyd position themselves in those growth markets? And can they position themselves in a world, unfortunately, that seems to be bifurcating between the East and West? And will they lose out on growth markets or stay in them? Can they stay almost a kind of... Um, not on any one side, if you will. And because they're tied to Germany, are they going to be tied to one side or the other? Or can they kind of stay unbiased, neutral, if you will, and service the entire world, the East and the West? I think that's going to be really important as part of their strategy and a possible risk as well. Let's keep going. As you can see on the screen in front of you right now, the next slide I want to share is something so interesting, the shareholder structure. For a very long time, this company was not publicly traded. Now it is, but you can see why. You can see that um, it is highly concentrated the ownership amongst certain owners. And um, a lot of these owners are just families or holding companies. Um, you can even see uh, one of the big holders, 10% is the public investment fund on behalf of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. These are uh, governments. These are big stakeholders. You can see that the free float is only 3.6%. And so it is interesting that the average everyday person, you and me, the people watching this channel, um, finally have an opportunity to invest in this company. And so when I was doing my research on this company, which is an ADR, I had a lot of trouble getting good information. I wanted to share with you really quickly where a starting point is for me here. Here in the U.S. looking at ADRs because it's so hard, so difficult if you don't know where to look. The first thing I want to share with all of you is uh, Citigroup. So check it out on the screen right now. Uh, a lot of these ADRs, they don't even index on Google. So it's better just to go to Citigroup. They have a whole directory of all the ADRs. And you can basically, ADR is an American depository receipt. It's the ability to own a foreign company here in the U.S. through a transfer agent, if you will, or an intermediate bank, if you will. And so I looked up Hapag Lloyd on Citigroup's ADR website, and then I got the information you see in front of you right here. And basically the most important thing on this entire screen is when you kind of look towards the bottom for HPGLY, it says, um, who is the depository? And it basically says, hey, it's an unsponsored depository, meaning it's not sponsored officially by the company Hapag Lloyd, but basically B-O-N-Y, Bank of New York, is the one who is has these ADRs. And so what I did next is I went to Bank of New York and I started looking up there on their ADR website. Okay, I want to see, I want to learn more about Hapag Lloyd. So check it out on the screen right now in front of you. You can learn a bit more about the ADR right here. And you can see the CUSIP. You can see uh, the ratio. Uh, it's uh, basically a two for one. And so each... Um, 
share basically of HPGLY um, is in a ratio of uh, two to one. And you can understand the country is Germany. You can see the effective date. This was started in 2016, these ADRs, not that old. You can see it's unsponsored and you can see the industry there. And so now we understand just a little bit that, hey, this isn't some um, risky fly-by-night ADR. This isn't some wacky pink sheet. This is backed by a bank of New York Mellon. This is a big bank. They're involved in a lot of ADRs. They're involved in a lot of um, pension funds and um, uh, college savings accounts. They have the Pershing bro brokerage under a bank of New York that some of you may be familiar with. They do a lot of work behind the scenes with retirement accounts and IRAs and college savings funds, those kinds of things. And so Bank of New York is a really good bank from my experience when it comes to these kinds of things. It's a trustworthy bank. I wouldn't, wouldn't even consider buying this ADR if it was just some pink sheet and it was Joe Schmo created the ADR. No, it's backed by Bank of New York. But I wanted to understand what kind of fees am I paying on this thing? So as you can see on the screen next, they actually share the fees on Bank of New York. And you can see that basically they're charging uh, five cents uh, per share. And they're doing that for a lot of different things, including the cash distributions, aka, um, well, I guess dividends, uh, stock dividend. They're doing it here for just annual depository service. And so there are some fees that eat away from returns here. And a cable fee was like, wow, what's that? $17.50. Uh, $17 but that's only if I want to go to Bank of New York and call on the actual underlying shares and say, I don't want the ADR anymore. I want the actual shares that are based out of Germany. I don't see myself doing that. So I don't think that cable fee is going to apply to me. But um, that's where I'm at with my ADR research. Next, what I want to do in the video today is I want to get into some risks because obviously there's risks with this company. If I were to buy it, it would be less than 1% of my portfolio. One thing I want to mention with all of you out there when um, I'm doing uh, videos like this, I always have kind of a um, kind of on deck watch list of stocks at any given time that I kind of like, and I kind of would potentially buy if they're in my buy zone. One of them, for example, is WD40 Company. I reviewed this a long time ago on my channel. I'll link to it in the pinned comment below the video review. I never ended up buying it because it was always overvalued. Thankfully, Hapag Lloyd right now, it's kind of in my buy zone, and so I would consider buying it now. But it's nice to have a watch list with kind of some stocks I'd really like to own, but at some point, you know, I may own only if they're in the right buy zone. Anyway, I want to share some risks with all of you today. Check it out on the screen. These are the risks risks that I see with Hapag Lloyd. And so basically the risks are fuel costs. If they keep up so high and if they keep going even higher, can they pass along such inflationary costs to their customers in perpetuity? They're making a lot of money right now as well. At a certain point, can these high freight rates that our customers are paying right now, are they going to hold up? Even the company is saying no. Even one of their largest stakeholders I was reading about was saying that the profits were almost too good to be true. He was saying it's unsustainable. It's too much, too much profit. I've never heard a key stakeholder say too much profit, but that's the world we live in now. But honestly, I think we're going to expect uh, profits to go uh, normalize a little bit here, but they can still afford to pay a handsome dividend and that will only grow over time with global commerce. I honestly think this carbon neutral is a potential risk because how much is that going to cost them over long periods of time? I think that um, it's a competitive industry with a lot of players. How can they stay ahead? I think they can stay ahead with savvy acquisitions, with a technological innovation. And um, I don't know, put in the comments how else you think they can stay ahead. But I think... Um, there's something to be said for their heritage being around since the 1800s. They've probably picked up a thing or two about their industry that helps them create a competitive moat. Geopolitics are a risk. Um, nationalism and slowing global, global trade could play a risk. I think especially this bifurcation between the East and West. And what I want to share last, I don't know if it's a risk or if it's a benefit or if it's just kind of a change that they have to adapt to, but China is building an initiative called One Belt, One Road. And this is a, if you will, modern Silk Road that's going to connect a lot of different countries. And It'll be interesting. Will China try to disintermediate someone like Hapag Lloyd so Hapag Lloyd does not play a role in that? Or will Hapag Lloyd play a role in that? And if they do play a role in that, I think that could be very good for their company. But as you can see on the screen right now, Hapag Lloyd did a press release recently related to how they're trying to stay involved kind of in this trade route, this One Belt, One Road. And they did that by acquiring an ownership stake in a key port that is part of a basically destination of travel on the One Belt, One 
one road. And so I think they're trying to play a part in this. This all gets really, really, really tricky right now. And if you ask me, why isn't the stock trending higher than it is already. Well, One Belt, One Road, one of the things about that initiative is it basically connects um, China, it connects it to Russia, and it connects it to Europe. And there's a lot of confusion right now with this war in Ukraine. How is all this going to pan out? What's it going to mean for the global economy? What, what's going to happen here? Because if Europe, for example, takes sides and Hapag Lloyd being a German company um, is forced to potentially side with Europe, that could disintermediate them potentially from One Belt, One Road. Because what if One Belt, One Road at some point just disintermediates Europe and it basically just starts, um, you know, who knows? I think the, I'm, I'm not a ge uh, geography expert out there, but uh, so maybe there's no way to kind of get around, get around it all. But I'm sure if there is a way to get around uh, of uh, Europe, China will find a way. But put in the comments below, if you're an expert, Look, I live in the U.S. I don't learn a lot about this stuff, but you're a um, geography expert or if you're an expert on global trade, you know a lot about these things. Please put in the comments below just how you could see this panning out for a German shipping company as it pertains to global strife, nationalization, the separation of the East and the West. How could all of this play out? What I would say at the end of the day is... The best thing for this possible, this company possibly speaking would be to stay unbiased, to be a neutral party, and to hopefully service the East and West in global shipping needs. But we just don't know what will happen. And so it'll be really interesting. And I think that's one of the reasons that uncertainty, why the stock price isn't even higher than it is, why the P.E. ratio is so low. I think the other reason why the P.E. ratio is so low right now, obviously, is they're in a boom cycle and everyone knows that won't last forever. Put in the comments below if you know a lot more than shipping than me. I would love to hear your comments. I am new to this industry. I'm learning about it. Um, one thing I've learned as a dividend investor is the older I get, the more experienced I get, the more humble I get because I'm always learning. I don't know everything. And I love learning from the community. So share in the comments below, especially my German subscribers. I'd love to hear your perspectives on this company from a German perspective. And um, I love German engineering, by the way, uh, greatest engineering around when it comes to automobiles, in my humble opinion. And so I hope some of that heritage gets into the advanced systems at Hapag Lloyd as well. And I'm sure it does. And I'm sure that's where they're differentiating. I love you all. If you enjoyed the video, please go ahead and smash the like button. It really means the world to me. Before I go today, in terms of full disclosure, I may initiate a position in Hapag Lloyd, ticker HPGLY. We shall see. Um, I probably will. And so I want to add that as a disclosure. Also, I am long Norfolk Southern, ticker NSC. I am long also Dutch Bros, ticker BROS. And I am long Otis Elevator, ticker OTIS. Before I go today, in terms of a friendly disclaimer, today's video is not investment advice. I'm not a licensed investment advisor. I'm just sharing my journey here on YouTube for fun and entertainment. If you're going to go out and invest in the stock market or anywhere else, please consult your licensed financial advisor. First, it's possible to lose money in the stock market with these unprecedented times that we are all living through. Um, I'm just sharing my journey here on YouTube for fun and entertainment. And... Um, I am sharing all my successes and mistakes. Also, in terms of a uh, disclaimer, today's video, it's not um, tax advice. I'm not a licensed tax advisor. Before I leave today, I just also want to interject. Um, my heart goes out to anyone in uh, facing global war right now. I know that's a hot topic, and it plays into the discussion I was talking about today. I was trying to take a step back for the discussion today and just speak to things from a I would say unbiased, pragmatic standpoint of global trade and where we're at. But obviously, I understand that certain things are more important than money and that certain things are um, important to take a stand on. And so I just want to make sure that everyone understands I'm not trying to um, ignore, uh, per se, the global strife, the war that is happening right now that affects trade routes and affects the One Belt, One Road initiative and the global trade circuit that Hapag Lloyd is a part of. What I was trying to speak to is just that Given what's going on, we just don't know where things are going with global trade. We just don't know, and it could affect the company negatively. And, um, you know, whether they decide to stay in the global trade route or get out of it, 
obviously I understand that certain decisions are more important than money and my heart goes out to anyone affected by the um, horrible nature of war and I always pray for peace and I love everyone here watching from all around the world. This is a global community. That's my favorite thing ab about dividend investing and talking about dividends here, here on YouTube. I am getting tired. I love you all and I'm going to see you in the comments below and I'm going to see you in the next video. <laughs>